The Story of Marinus and Fira Adapted from Chapter 44 of the American Demon Waltz It was the summertime of 1909, and expeditions from the west had nearly reached the south pole of Antarctica. That ultimate claim on the frontier had not been made yet, though many brave souls had made unsuccessful attempts in recent years. Inside the whalebone and animal skin huts of the expedition campground, James Edmund Marinus was beginning to forget what summer back home even felt like. He was here seeking a man who called himself Fira. There were strains of piano in the air that were coming from somewhere not too far away. In the harsh winds and fatal cold, the nearby piano was dampened to a soft and almost indiscernible volume by the time it reached James' ears. How could someone be playing piano, thought Marinus to himself. It hurt his fingers simply to imagine removing his gloves to play an instrument. The keys themselves, and the hammers inside, too, must all be sealed in ice. He shivered beneath his coat to imagine it, and for a moment James felt sure that the music must be coming from a phonograph recording of impossible quality. As he continued listening, though, he knew that the somber music was coming over the air from a live source. Some madman is shaking the arctic freeze out of a piano. He will surely lose at least a few fingertips for his effort. James approached the music, having no hint as to where within the camp's timber walls he should seek out his contact. He was scheduled to meet a man known only as Fira. That was all he knew. When he found the source of the playing, however, James Marinus suspected that he had found the man in question. The strange man greeted James Marinus with a businesslike smile as he rose from the piano to shake hands. Through his woolen glove, Marinus could feel the iciness of Fira's grip. You must be the exploration contractor I have heard so much about, said the man whom the cold did not seem to be affecting. Please sit. We have much to discuss. Fira gestured to a wooden crate from which the lid had already been pried, and now rested askew on top of the box. There was apparently little need to protect the cargo from the harsh, cutting wind that swept through the tents of the camp. From the crate, Fira produced something that looked to be a coconut sealed multiple times beneath layers of melted wax. I need these, said Fira. Planted all over the tundra and as far down along the coastal ice flows as their quantity permits. These are, seeds. Essentially, they are. No species of seed on planet Earth can grow anywhere up here, sir. With all due respect, you'll be wasting your stock to try them here. Do not concern yourself with whether they will accept the climate. I only need someone capable of traversing the geography to plant them as I have specified. Looking more closely, James Marinus could see that the items were only similar to coconuts in that they were roughly round and of a comparable size. Beneath the paraffin wax, the alleged seed was pink with red and blue streaks running through it. It was also irregularly textured across its surface. The object looked more like a hunk of flesh than any sort of nut or plant material. I need each one buried no fewer than three meters beneath the surface of the ice, said Fira, with at least five generous paces of distance between the individual seeds. Digging that deep will be nearly impossible in the permanent freeze, said Marinus. No doubt, said Fira. But I trust I've selected the right man for the job. Take this crate, and bury one seed to the depth I have specified. Do so here, within the campground's perimeter, and finish the task before tonight. Come morning, I will inspect your work to confirm that it is satisfactory. And then what, sir? Marinus did not expect to feel comforted by whatever was coming next. After that, I will send you on your way with half of the pay for your men. They will begin work the night after this one. And please, be thorough in your work. I promise that I will detect any attempts to do less than what has been agreed upon. But no seeds will ever come up in this weather, Mr. Fira, and certainly none that are buried more than three meters down in the ice. I did not ask you whether they would. James Edmund Marinus accepted the crate and bid the strange man goodbye. That night, he set about disassembling one of the otherworldly seeds. 
James had planted one in the center of the campground before retiring for the night, just as Fira had instructed. The oddness of all this continued to keep him awake, however. He needed to learn more. James resolved to investigate the wax-coated items that he had been tasked with burying. He retrieved one from the crate, and carefully melted away the wax from its surface. He collected what dripped away in a tin pan, he turned the lump of pink over the flame until the encased object inside began to reveal itself. Inside the wax was a living tumor, warm to the touch and pulsing with an energy that it generated from inside itself. As James Marinus held the mass in his hand, he found that it clung eagerly to his flesh. In disgust, he flung the tumor off. It landed with a heavy thud onto the table. James saw that the object had drawn blood from his palm through the surface of his skin. In that way, it was much like a leech trying to suction itself onto a host to feed. The tumor began now instead to adhere itself to the table. It merged with the wood to form a stalagmite of living tissue. James felt deep panic to see how the substance grew so wildly animate as soon as its wax encasement was broken. His hand was bleeding significantly now. Had the ungodly stuff poisoned him in such a short time? The blood that came out was thin like water, and ran from his palm as though it would never clot. Marinus rushed to wrap his hand in a clean cloth, and then set about remelting the wax he had collected in the tin pan. Pouring the paraffin over the seed's core as best he could, James found that the stuff had already spread across the table too much to be covered by the wax he had saved. Marinus worked with candles from his own collection to finish the job of containing the substance. In the process, he discovered quite by accident that the incorrigible stuff was at least ill-disposed to fire. It retreated from an open flame, but seemingly not much else. After perhaps an hour of work, the unholy stuff was safely contained once again. No longer a small and neat orb, this particular seed now occupied most of the surface of the table upon which it had been resale led. James resolved to confront Fyra the next morning as soon as the sun had risen. The following day, he found Fyra at the center of the campground. The strange man was inspecting the roughly tilled spot where the first seed had been buried. The sun was barely up, but Fyra looked to be wide awake, as though he had not slept at all. This is acceptable work, said Fyra to James as Marinus approached him. This will do. James was unsure as to how he should begin, and so he simply spat the words out. Find someone else, he said. This is evil work, I'm sure of it now. I simply cannot continue to help you complete whatever twisted thing you have planned for the Antarctic. Fyra simply stared at James with a look of escalating rage. Then, collecting himself, Fyra spoke. Let me make this all very clear, and palatably simple for the sake of your childish morality, sneered Fyra. You will do as I have contracted, and you will do it with attentive precision to every detail I have described. If you do not, I will see to it that Anna and young Henry both suffer grossly before I have them murdered. James' eyes went wide. He had never mentioned the name of his wife or son to anyone on this expedition. How could Fyra have known anything about them? You are threatening my family with violation and death. James said it only to confirm that the horrifying bizarreness of his encounter with Fyra had indeed escalated to such a monstrous climax. I can virtually guarantee that they will be remembered for generations as two of the most unfortunate victims ever to have suffered in the East Midlands. That's correct by the way, isn't it? Fyra broke indifferently from his threats to ask the question. They live in Derbyshire, last I checked. Do I still have their current address? It was all correct, and James felt himself growing paralyzed with fear. He said nothing, and so Fyra continued. I want you to look into my eyes, and know that I am serious about everything I say. Be glad at least that the guilt of what you must do rests entirely on my shoulders. I have coerced you so thoroughly that none of this can ever be called your fault. What in God's name are you having me do? That is not your concern. Fyra turned to leave, and for a moment James Edmund Marinus considered uttering some final protest. As if reading his mind, Fyra turned around just as he had reached the entrance to his tent, and said, I wish you the very best of luck, 
Mr. Marinus. You will surely need it for the expedition ahead of you. I truly hope, in my heart of hearts, that you will be able to kiss your wife and hold your child again after all this is through. Focus on that as your goal, and nothing else, and you will surely be victorious. Fyra disappeared inside his tent, and from outside James heard the strains of that same strange tune from the piano beginning to play. <laughs>